Okay, everyone got their microphones turned off. Right, um, just trying to get on speaker view. It doesn't work. Okay, <clears throat> so this uh, presentation is about the lower cauldron on its own, but it's actually very difficult to talk about one cauldron and not refer to the other two. They are all interconnected. But uh, when this is recorded, I will put it on to the YouTube channel. And on the YouTube channel, there is a three cauldrons overview. And in future months that we do a presentation on the middle cauldron and the upper cauldron. Now, <clears throat> I'll make references to those and hopefully one day people can swap, swap around from one to the other. So anyway, the, the lower cauldron, I nickname it the salmon weir and it's significant to this time of year with the Owen Grove because uh, Willow, which is where we are at the moment with the sun's path and having just left older, gone into the days of Willow, both older and Willow uh, touch on the Celtic law of the salmon and the salmon of wisdom and, and the sacred well that the salmon live in. Now, I'll give a few examples of this, but I also want to teach and, and demonstrate some simple Qigong exercises to help people activate their lower cauldrons. So it's not just an intellectual comprehension of the three cauldrons, but a way of actually working with them. And that's really important. I think. Um, in the overview, we have covered many little aspects of them, how you can work with the three cauldrons shamanically by journeying to them. But there is a physicality uh, to each of the cauldrons as, as well. For instance, um, it's quite funny, really, uh, the lower cauldron is governed by the legs. That's its simplistic way of looking at it in a more detailed health perspective it's actually the kidney channels that run up from the balls of the feet come up the legs to the kidneys but it, the the cauldron the lower cauldron is uh, managed and supported by the legs the, the you could draw a big salad bowl and just stick legs underneath it and and that's the lower cauldron the legs are an important part of it. Now, when I demonstrate in a little while, it'll make more sense, but you can just sit in a chair and work with your three cauldrons and you can lie down and work with them. But there's a physicality that improves the vitality of each cauldron. And so for the lower cauldron, it's working the legs. But that can be really magical and a lovely experience as well, which I'll come to. But just for the record, the middle cauldron is governed by the arms. The arms doing this, twisting back and forth. It's kind of binary in different ways. Uh, massage is the pericardium. Uh, the pericardium is like a protective a sheath around the heart and it's very soothing and, and calms you down and the limbs for the upper bowl doesn't have legs or arms the, the upper bowl has the spine and it has the in breath and the out breath the in breath and the out breath so when you're doing qi gung or tai chi all three cauldrons all three bowls are being activated in different ways they're one whole thing now, <clears throat> looking at the lower cauldron as the salmon weir, and I'm jumping the gun a little bit, I'll give some examples. So in Irish um, law, there's a magical well known as the Well of Shegis. It's like Connla's well. 
the well of Chegis is the source or the magical source of the river Boyne. And it's connected with um, the salmon of wisdom and the nine magical hazel trees and all of that kind of thing. Um, but the emphasis of the salmon at the source of a river is really important. And in Chinese uh, Taoist practices, the lower cauldron is seen as an infinite ocean, as a sea, uh, S-E-A. They call it the sea of qi or the sea of vitality and it's infinite. Now I'm gonna keep swapping back and forth between Chinese and Celtic things because they actually sing the same song and it will help get some of the more obscure Irish references now, so this, the Salmon of Wisdom is an, uh, a very old Irish thing. And we know from other Celtic star law, like the Ceridrin's Cauldron thing, that Pisces, which is where we are with the willow tree, corresponds with the Salmon of Wisdom. And actually, in the week ahead, we're going into the days of Ash. And Ash takes Pisces into Aries, what takes Salmon into the ram and that's actually in some Irish poetry to do with three cauldrons but if you're not aware of the star law it doesn't really grab you but if you are aware of the star law it's suddenly very significant so even Taliesin after his animal shape-shifting uh, rite of passage is found in a salmon weir you know the radiant brow is found in a salmon weir now there's this connection then between the lower cauldron and the upper cauldron, which we'll come to. <clears throat> now, um, in the natural world, salmon, the fish, is unique amongst fishes. And this very strange life cycle that salmon has, ancient people would have observed because no other fish jumps up river. You know, salmon actually jump up waterfalls. And why do they do that? That's the first question. Of course, now we know, now we understand that the whole life cycle of the salmon is that the source of the river, there is the spawning ground where the baby salmon are born and then they go down river and the one thing about them straight away then is that they're freshwater fish and they become saltwater fish and then they become freshwater fish that they somehow go from one reality into another reality and back to another reality again you know so they're a little shaman really uh, going between worlds but so the the young salmon go down their rivers and they go out to sea and, and they will travel far, far and far in the salty ocean and they will live to two or three years. So for th two or three years, they're in the salty sea, miles and miles away from their spawning ground. And then they decide to go back. So the mature salmon leave the salt water, which they've become adapted to, and then they go back somehow theoretically using the Earth's magnetic uh, fields. They manage to know where they go back to their original spawning ground. And to get back to their place of origin, they will jump up waterfalls and go against the tide. Once they get back to their spawning ground as mature fish, they... they lay their eggs and they die. And then the cycle repeats again. But ancient people would have observed this, you know, this, this amazing thing, but symbolically then, what is it? It's a creature that goes from one reality to another reality and back again. But more than that, it returns to the source. Now think about that magically or spiritually to do with you 
and your life and maybe ideas of previous incarnations or of your higher self and previous existences and stuff to actually go back to the source of where you've come from not just you today in the flesh and bone body you're in right now but back to the source of all things you know so the salmon of wisdom the oldest animal if you like is showing that by its life cycle this return to the source now um poetically it's given the name of the salmon's leap the you know, salmon leaping back up the river if you like now um one interesting character from Irish mythology is the warrior Cahulin, Cúchulain, Cahulin, and um, he goes to the Isle of Skye to, to learn how to be a warrior from a female warrior teacher called Skathak, and he proves himself by doing an impossible task that no one else has ever been able to pull off. Uh, he's the first person to achieve it, and it's called the Salmon's Leap. You know, it, it, if you fail, you die with this thing, you know, but he managed to do this Salmon's Leap. And uh, he then goes on to become the most heroic warrior Ireland ever had. And he famously writes Oum inscriptions on wooden branches and all of this sort of thing. Um, but then he's not a man, uh, he's half God, his father is Lu, um, and Lu actually in Irish mythology invented the game Fidgel, uh, wood sense, tree sense, forest logic stuff. So it's interesting that the son of Lu, who did the salmon's leap, um, also had the knowledge of writing Oum inscriptions on branches and stuff. Although he does it in a very macabre way, it's quite brutal times. So he get a tree trunk and put an inscription on it and then put decapitated heads on it to keep warriors away. It was quite, quite horrible times. Um, but the symbolism of the salmon's leap is there. Another funny thing with Kukolin is that um, when he's fighting, he goes berserk, a bit like uh, the Incredible Hulk, and his whole body changes shape. They call it a warp spasm, like he literally turns, turns his body inside out and doubles in size and stuff. Um, these are poetic metaphors for raging berserkness. But what's interesting is there's an account where he's so hot and berserk from fighting that he just can't calm down. And to calm him down, the people get three vats, three barrels, three cauldrons. Now, there's these three barrels that are needed to calm him down. Now, the interesting thing is with the three cauldrons or the three dantians, it's to do with chi, uh, energy, life force, um, and which is usually described as heat or fire or internal sunshine. So here's Kukolin bursting with so much chi that he's just raging hot. And they bring out these three barrels of ice cold water to calm him down. And they force him into the first one and it boils and bursts apart because he's so hot. You know, then they put him in the second one and the water boils, but it doesn't burst apart. And then the third one, it just calms him down and he comes back to sanity. But it's quite interesting that the image of three vessels is there and also heat of the warrior or too much chi or, or what have you. It's just a glimpse that even in, you know, it, how there are similarities between uh, Celtic stories and Chinese insights, if you like. Now, um, in Star Lord, then, uh, we touched on this in the overview, the each part of the body is governed by a different sign of the zodiac. 
uh, Leo is the heart, Sagittarius is the thighs, uh, Aries is the head. Now Pisces, the salmon weir, uh, is the feet. Pisces governs the feet. It's the furthest part of your body from your brain, if you like. It's the extreme far away. Now, in Chinese, the source of the kidney channel, which governs the lower cauldron, is at the balls of the feet. And in English, it's translated as the bubbling spring. You know, so this idea that source of a stream or bubbling spring coinciding with traditional zodiac law that the feet are governed by Pisces, the fish, you know? But here's the thing then, the zodiac year um, traditionally begins at the spring equinox rather than the winter solstice. So the sun's year begins at winter solstice, but the zodiac year begins with the spring equinox. And its first sign is Aries the ram. And then you go around through the year and the final sign of the sun's path or ecliptic is Pisces the fish. So the Alpha and Omega, if you like, it begins with Aries and finishes with Pisces. But to start a new cycle, you have to get from the feet, from, from Pisces the fish to Aries, which is from the feet to the head. Isn't that interesting? So, Zodiac wise, you start with the head at Aries and it comes down to the neck and shoulders at Taurus and it, it works its way down through the body, Scorpio being your sexual area and Sagittarius being your thighs and Capricorn your lower leg and then Pisces, the fish and the uh, feet and so on. So it's gone down, 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 down. But to begin a new cycle, you have to get from the feet to the head. So that's a proper salmon's leap, you know, energetically, energy coming up from your feet to the top of your head sort of thing. And that makes that connection. And the, uh, the days of ash do that with the ash tree. Um, but that happens then with the qigong that I'll show you. Um, and it happens with every in-breath and out-breath, really, this thing. But... So I just wanted to point out that um, the head is Aries, the ram, or the beginning of a new year, a new zodiac year is Aries, the ram at spring equinox. And that Pisces, the fish, the salmon is the end of a cycle. And that to join them together, you have to have the salmon leap jumping up the waterfall to make that connection. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to read a little paragraph from this, and it's the, the proper translation from the little manuscript about the three cauldrons. Uh, this is the translation by Kathleen Matthews. And I'll read it slowly. It's only about six lines. But bear in mind the idea of this salmon's leap and Aries the ram. And it's talking about the upper cauldron. And it's talking about how for most people it's down, but you, there are certain things you can do that turn it upwards. Now, just to give you a heads up, uh, literally heads up um, on this, it's the lower cauldron that activates the middle and the upper. So when, when I read some of this stuff to do the upper cauldron, it's actually powered by the lower cauldron, even though the paragraph doesn't say that. Well, I could explain it shortly. But anyway, here's, here's the reading. Um, there are two chief divisions of joy by which joy can overturn the cauldron of knowledge. So it's joy or happiness that turns it upwards. And the two divisions are divine spiritual and human. Now, the human joy that can turn it upwards has four divisions and they are thus. The first one is the force of sexuality or the energy of sexuality. And that's to do with the lower cauldron and I'll explain that from a Qigong thing in a minute. 
Um, so the, the force or energy of sexuality. Then there is the joy of health. Health and well-being turns it up as well. The third is the joy of attaining poetic privilege after long study. So, you know, that's a slot studying Celtic stories and picking them apart and getting inspiration from them and so on. Now, here's the, the, the fourth way, the fourth joy. And this, I'll read this slowly. The joy at the approach of Imbus amassed by the nine hazels of the fair fruitfulness of Shegis of the she, which hurtles upstream along the boin in a ram's head bore. Oh, there's a lot there to think about. So first of all, the joy received by the approach of imbas. Imbas is the Irish word for arwen or inspiration. So the joy of inspiration coming. And it's the inspiration from the nine hazels of fair fruitfulness. Of course, the nine hazels are the hazels at the source of um, <clears throat> the well of the salmon of wisdom. So I just got plugged back in. Okay. But then it describes uh, the nine hazels from the fair fruitfulness of the Shages of the She, that's the, the well of the shining ones, that the source of the river Boyne, if you like. But then it describes, look, think again of salmon going upstream, and we're talking of the river Boyne, and that connection between the salmon to Aries the ram. So it hurtles upstream along the Boyne in a ram's head bore. Strange imagery to use, but if you think of the zodiacal stuff, it makes, starts to make sense. You know, it's the return of the salmon of wisdom going back to the source from which the river Boyne comes from. And it's driving with such power that they're using the metaphor of ram's horns uh, driving the power of that, you know, and that salmon's leap is going to take you back to a new cycle, if you like. So Qigong wise, the lower cauldron is to do with the continuous constant cycle of your own energy inside you. Okay. So I'll demonstrate that with a little bit of Qigong, because I did touch on it in the overview, but it will help if you can see what I'm talking about. Now, you can try and copy if you like, by suggesting you just sit there, but this will be on YouTube. So then you can use the YouTube clip to try it at a, a later date if you like. So I don't want to spend too long on it. I'll just do it about five, five minutes or so, but it's easier to demonstrate it than just say it. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> the key thing is to stand with your feet the shoulder width apart, not, too, not out here, and you don't want the toes out or the heels out, you just want parallel feet, really, and the key thing is just to sit down. Now, I touched on it in the overview, you must be able to wiggle your toes. And then what you're really trying to do is give all of your body weight to your thighs. And it looks like this. I'll do it sideways, you'll see it better. So standing like this, just, just casual standing, the lower cauldron isn't activated, it's not turned on. This is just casual stance. But if I bend my knees slightly and I relax my tailbone down, almost like I'm perching my bottom to sit on a chair or a stool, if you like. But this kind of from casual to down, 
works in the thighs and it's the thighs that will create the internal energy and the heat and the chi, okay? Now, you don't wanna be leaning forwards, that's no good. You don't wanna be leaning backwards. You just wanna be upright. And the key thing is that you can wiggle your toes. If you come into your toes and you can't wiggle them, then the knees are holding your body weight, which is no good, uh, it's bad for your knees. So you come off your toes, your toes can wiggle, and then you just relax your tailbone down. And suddenly the thighs are holding your body weight. And you wanna keep that feeling. So if you can stand like this for a while, say eight minutes, quite hard to do eight minutes, um, the spine starts to relax, the vertebrae start to separate. Now the key thing is to keep the hips level and body weight into the heels, okay? And then you can do some qigong to help with that. So a basic qigong is just circles with the arms, but you're doing it with the breath. So this is a breathing in. And then as I breathe out, I begin by relaxing my tailbone. So it begins with the exhale of the tailbone down. So it's slow breathing, still breathing out. Three days stand still, pause, breathing in. Pineal bend, three days stand still, breathing out. So just a basic circle. This is called the small orbit of chi, the small energy circle, if you like. Now, watch this, watch my legs. Don't do this, people often do it wrong. So here, I've engaged the thighs, they're working, but you don't want to straighten the legs, okay? So you sit down and you stay sitting down. There's no up and down with the legs. So you're in the legs and you stay in the legs, okay? It's all about compressing the body weight into the thighs. And even as you breathe in and out, you're still in the thighs and they, they'll be a bit tired, a bit tired after doing it. Now, you can do this under a tree. I've got ideas of tree breathing for health and medicine and a tra traditional Chinese way of standing is to make a, a circle with the arms like this. So it's a very round kind of feeling. It's like you're hugging a tree, if you like. And they stand like that. <clears throat> five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, just building up your energy, building up the energy in the lower cauldron. So there's two things happening. The thighs are working. And with the slow breathing, you're compressing the diaphragm down and that's massaging the lower organs. All of this is good for your kidneys and your life force and so on. Now, <clears throat> one little cheat gun I want to give you just because it's three cauldrons. It's from China, and they don't call it the three cauldrons, it's, but it's for the three dantians. It's the same thing, okay? And it's a very simple one. Uh, I'll do it twice through, and then you can use YouTube to go back over it. But the main thing is to just stay down in the thighs with your knees slightly bent. Don't come up, you just down, stay down. And we're gonna come up and down the center and this relates to each of the cauldrons. So for the lower cauldron, it only comes up to about just before the ribs, like this, breathing in. Three days stand still, and then pressing back down. And three days stand still. Now, the middle bowl comes to between your shoulder blades. And then the thumbs go down and you push outwards as you exhale. Still exhaling. Okay. Then the upper bowl comes to the throat. Palms turn to the sky 
And as you push to the sky, you sit down and exhale. Still exhaling. I'll do it sideways. So lower bowl. Pressing down. So it's putting energy just in the lower cauldron. Now drawing energy up to the shoulder blades. Now this goes outwards as you exhale. Settling down. And then the throat to the sky, sitting down. So very simple exercises then. So you could do, as a little routine, you could do a basic circle three times, in breath, out breath, I'm speeding it up. And then you could do lower bowl, middle bowl, upper bowl. And you could do that three times. So you could do three cauldrons three times, and then three circles to finish. It's going to give you a, a good five minute routine that gets your thighs warm. And that's the key thing for activating the lower cauldron. So <clears throat> with the energy cycle in the body, the winter solstice corresponds with the lower region between your legs. And the rising of energy is the in-breath. So we would be going from winter solstice um, so summer solstice at the neck. So coming. And then after the summer solstice, coming back down in the autumn into the winter. They call this the small orbit of chi. So it looks like this coming up. Three day standstill, going down. Three day standstill coming up. Three day standstill going down. So they, they call it an orbit or a circle because that's what it feels like, but it's not an uh, orbit or circle. It's up the central nervous system, your spinal cord, and down through the peripheral nervous system through your fingers and toes. So it's more like a fountain, comes up the, the main tree trunk of the fountain and then cascades down. But it, it feels like a circle because the spine is at the back. So it has this feeling like that. Now, <clears throat> the reason that they call it the small orbit of chi is because on your own, you can only do a small orbit. You know, that, that's, you've got your three cauldrons and a firewall of aura or energy around them, if you like. Um, for the Taoists, it does lead on to ideas of what would you call it, tantric or sexual magic or, or, or so on. And um, that insight is quite interesting. Just, just very quickly, within yourself, you've a circle of energy that's driven by your breath and so on. Um, when you're French kissing with somebody, you become a figure of eight if you like, you know, that's why it's so intoxicating, kissing like that, you know, energy wise. But the big orbit of chi is done by two people. So their heads are together and the, the lower cauldrons are together, if you like, and that makes a big orbit of chi. So, but taking that sexual idea, you can use that also for tree medicine, you know, because uh, an, a relationship is a relationship, a sharing, is a sharing so equally you can hold a tree and have that same sort of giving and receiving of energy it needn't be sexual you know it's just energy really and orgasm is that but the so the cycle of the year where we're at now it's that rising energy so the winter solstice with the yew tree is everything down 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 in the lower cauldron but as the sun is reborn energy starts to come up your spinal cord for birch and rowan and alder and willow and ash for spring equinox, 
roughly going to be in the middle somewhere. And after spring equinox, it's going to be hawthorn, oak and holly and hazel, and then apple at summer solstice at the neck. So that the cycle of the year, whether it's trees, is still this rising. So right now with the willow tree, we're, we're drawing energy up the spinal cord towards the middle bowl. And when we get to spring equinox, there we are with, with the ash tree at the midpoint, if you like. And then we're going to go into hawthorn oak, holly, hazel and apple sort of thing before descending back down again. So there's many ways you can work with this, but understanding that every exhale is a return back to the lower cauldron, back to the salmon of wisdom and so on. So I just wanted to recap that paragraph then, the, the four ways of turning it up are human joy has four divisions. Thus, the force of sexuality, that rising energy um, that will go right up the spinal cord to the pineal gland for orgasm or kundalini rising or so on and forth. But the, the Irish manuscript is, manuscript is acknowledging that sexual energy of the lower cauldron, or you could say the root chakra or the sacral chakra, you know, it's all there driven by the animal power of the Sagittarius thighs, the fire of the thighs or the fire of the loins is, is all there. We mustn't be shy of that, you know. Um, it's pure vitality. And, and the second is the joy of health, you know, so the well-being of a, a vibrant body full of vitality. And the joy attaining poetic privilege after long study. And one more time, the approach of imbas amassed by the nine hazels of fair fruitfulness in Shegis of the she which hurtles upstream along the boin in a ram's head bore. So some ideas there of working with the lower cauldron. Now we're turn the microphones back on and we can talk about those ideas. Yuri, when it mentions about the ram's head boar, do you think that means boar as in a, a tide? Yes, that's how it's like, spelled, like the seven boar. Uh, yes. In yeah. the book, it's spelled B O R E. So it's not a male pig. It's, it's yeah. a boar. Yeah. Uh, the seven has that famously, doesn't it? And, and also in the Mabinogin it has um, a giant salmon going up the river seven to rescue Mabon as well. But again, it's a salmon going up river to rescue a youth, you know, curious. And that's in Glastonbury Abbey. That's the, is it the salmon that they have? You know, that's carved, that's carved into the abbey wall. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think so. Yes, it's a the the fish is a symbol of the Piscean oh, Age. So Christianity has used a fish for itself. You know, and, and lots of cathedrals have various fish patterns, which can be Pisces the fish and the Piscean Age as well. That was awesome. Did it all sound all right? I didn't know Did what you record it. Yes, I, yes. I, and I was hoping to try and make my window fill the screen, but it wouldn't work for me. So it's still a small window. I'm still not that good. I'd at, like to do those. Those yeah. exercises were good to do. Yeah. So they're very simple. That There are hundreds of Qigong exercises, but those two are the most simple. Um, yeah. Small orbit is just a circle of the hands and back down. So it's breathing in, breathing out you know, but all the times keeping your body weight down and in, investing in the bitterness. They say, take the bitter pill. And that means your thighs get a bit tired, but it's really good for you. 
you know, boost your immune system, produces more white blood cells. If you can't say you're handicapped in some way, then, you know, you just do what you can, but at least kind of sit upright sort of thing. And, and each of the three cauldrons has a gateway on the spine, um, it's a bit esoteric. So, but for the lower cauldron, they say two fingers distance below your belly button. So that's my belly button, two fingers below shooting an arrow through you to that corresponding part of the spine is where the lower cauldron gateway is. In Chinese, it's called the Ming Men. And uh, for Tai Chi and Qigong, it's a center point for movement, if you like, you know, every, every movement rotates from the Ming Men there to do the lower cauldron. So. Is that Dantian too? Dantian is, is the Chinese word for the cauldrons if you like you know so dantian just translates as uh sometimes people say cinnabar field uh, most people just say elixir field or field of energy really but they often use poetic metaphors of a bowl or a vessel uh, to help with movement ideas and stuff you know but it's interesting how <laughs> To do with ideas of energy rising or kundalini rising there's various various stages up the spinal cord corresponding to different areas you know so the gateway for the middle cauldron is just between your shoulder blades and the gateway for your upper cauldron is where your spine goes into your skull literally just there where the spine goes in sort of thing you know so energy wise you can visualize almost precision where you're drawing energy up from the lower bowl to a certain area and then letting it cascade back down again. I was gonna say, uh, hi, Yuri. Hi. The, um... Hi, Andy. Hi. Uh, the, the, the yin yang symbol is two fishes kind of swirling around each other. <sighs> Kind of uh, relates to the idea of the salmon going, uh, you know, up the stream to the, the salmon river. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I think that was things get lost in translation, of course. Um, so, like this this quote that I'm reading, it says that there are two chief divisions of joy, two chief right. Divisions. Now, in Taoism, they have two supreme ultimates, which are yin and yang. And, and usually that's translated into English as uh, heaven and earth. But that's a bad translation. I'll come back to that. But if you think of that idea that so there's two chief divisions. And then it says divine and human. So it's almost like saying there's yin and yang one is heaven one's earth it's the it's the same thing you know um what's wrong with that translation of heaven and earth is because the west has a christian background it tends to think of biblical heaven and earth but what what is really meant is by earth it means all physical manifestation so every distant galaxy and you know planet and star system is earth you know it's the physical manifestation and, it, and it's infinite and the heaven is the non-physical manifestation which is infinite so it's not as simple as heaven and earth it, it, but it's acknowledging that right at the beginning everything every body is physical and non-physical And actually two fish. Another, <laughs> another important distinction we could make is between Earth is the mundane exterior world that we're living in, and, and we keep it mundane, but interior-wise, there's a mythological reality. And that's heaven, and that's where the myths are projected onto the stars. 
the, the spirit world, you know, it, to be inspired, inspirited, it's the same thing. And even we've lost it in English because we just say breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. But in, I went to a Tai Chi thing in France and they still use Latin words that we have lost. So they say inspire, expire, inspire, <laughs> expire. But it, whenever you breathe in, it's in with the spirit. You're drawing spirit in. You know, and that's lost when you just say breathe in, breathe out, you know, so drawing in the spirit, being inspired, literally stimulating the pineal gland as well. This, And there is that moment of radiant brow and then there's back down again, you know, a little death, if you like, back to winter solstice. Another way I think of yin is the black hole everything that hasn't manifested but is absolutely potentially going to give birth the black hole is the universal beginning and then the cosmos is everything that emerges into the, this temporary exterior experience so it's these two things that are in balance cosmos is born from the black mother the yin and they're perfectly in balance and within the yin, it's not really chaos. It's really the perfect image that we would call Anwin, the perfect archetypal pattern that becomes the cosmos that's in there with everything, but it's held in suspension because it's a black hole. There's no time. That, that's it comes out of the black hole. It comes out of the black hole and it decays. And as it's decaying, we have time. But within the black hole, the great yin, the mother, there is no time. It's simply suspended as, it's the image of eternity, suspended forever. But all of that corresponds with the lower cauldron, of course, you know, because the Chinese consider it an infinite ocean, uh, infinite ocean of possibilities in the lower cauldron. It, it's an energy source that never runs out in theory, you know, but, um, the, the, the other sacred well in Ireland is Conla's well, and, and Conla's well with the Salmon of Wisdom is said to be under the sea, you know, and so it's deep down in the abyss, if you like, deep down in the depths of the lower cauldron, right down to the feet and the bubbling spring and everything, you know, so all those ideas are, they seem to be universal, you know, and so then the star law for the lower cauldron is the deep where you've got um, Pisces the fish and Virgo making that mermaid or Melusine or Lady of the Lake. And she's the divine feminine or yin of the deep, 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 you know? And then the star law of corresponding with that is Sagittarius and Gemini, which is this Milky Way soul path that cycles over the starry heavens and then descends into earth and to the very lowest part of the Milky Way where there's Melusine, the Lady of the Lake, the Cauldron, and the constellation of the Raven with the Cauldron. And then it returns back up Sagittarius, the thighs, back into the Milky Way again. So all of the star law song of the lower Cauldron is the deep, I don't know where I'm going with that, but yes, <laughs> you know, it's the infinite well. And so within ourselves, that salmon's leap is, you know, when you've got all your body weight into your thighs and you're going down into the balls of the feet where the bubbling spring is, when you breathe in, that's your salmon's leap because you're drawing energy from the lowest region up to your head, Aries. So that exhale, the, the inhale is the salmon's leap that draws spirit to your pineal gland from your well, from your lower cauldron. Three, three random thoughts from me, Yuri, and they are random, but you're, That's good. they have some connection. The first one is I, I, I equate very much with this whole um, domain, if you like, because my, my spirit name is um, salmon, wild salmon swimming home, which I've had for many years, wild salmon swimming home. So I have a real sense of that return to the source and, and what it involves.
poles, which is swimming and jumping upstream. The second one, we live quite close to the, the River Severn. So that story of the salmon swimming up to, to it, well, it was a castle or a prison on, on an island at, at Gloucester where the Mabon was imprisoned and the salmon um, was, was the means by which that release occurred. Um, and that's a fascinating story and it's local. So yeah, it has, a, has an extra resonance. The third wild and completely random thought, and it's, it's the poet, it's poetry really. Um, it, it's the, there's no direct association, but what comes to me with the Pisces of the feet, you said Pisces was, was in the feet and then the salmon's leap to the head, Aries. And um, I'm just taken with the notion of source and connection with the earth and soul. You know, the fact our feet, we have a soul on the bottom of our feet. I, I just, I'm just, uh, I, I love that poetic and, and it, it may, may be no more, but there's a connect, there's something more there, you know, the soul of the foot and the soul of the soul connection through that cycle. Just curious. Random thoughts. <laughs> They're all very good ones. Yeah. Thank you. Feet can be a map of the whole body, of course. That's the yeah, idea behind you. reflexology. Yeah. Someone was talking. Uh, yes, sure. I was just interested in the link when you're talking about the sick, like the working your way up with the energy through the cauldrons. If, for example, um, you've had a, a spinal injury between you where the lower cauldron is and not quite before the, the upper one, is there a way of building the strength? Because as you say, you need to hold the strength in your thighs, but then if there's an imbalance further up uh, between the upper, well, suppose the thorax and the lower cauldron, is there a way of trying to build strength doing the same thing or just pra by practice of these ex this exercise you're explaining about? It, they're good questions. And... Um, People with all sorts of handicaps or even vertebrae that are fused together can still do qigong. You mm. know, um, it's just your yeah. movement capacity or your posture alignment is going to be compromised in some way. But that doesn't mean that you don't do it at all. For instance, look at this. Yeah. So. I've got a chair here. Even someone who can't stand properly, for instance, they could hold a Zimmer frame. And, and by holding a Zimmer frame, they could still just try and relax the tailbone down and wiggle the toes, but keep hold of the Zimmer frame. So even if they're 85, they could still try and work their thighs gently. And say your spine is crooked in some way, well, it's very difficult to uncrooked it but you could uh, sit down on a chair and be as upright as you can. And you might not be able to be like this, you might be stuck like that, but you could be as upright as you can. And what you can always do, so long as you're alive, is breathe slowly. Now that breathe slowly is really important because the deeper you do an in-breath, the more the roof of the diaphragm presses down and squeezes the lower organs. So those lower organs will press from the inside the vertebrae and help the spine by a kind of internal massage. And also by breathing deeply, you're expanding the lungs and that can open up the upper spine and the shoulder blades and stuff. So even if you can't stand properly, or you've got a crooked back, even very conscious deep breathing is going to be a good internal massage that will help your spine. Yeah. The reason I was asking, I have, I've got osteoporosis and I've had a compression fracture. I used to do Tai Chi many years ago and I'm trying to get back into doing the breathing, but I was really interested when you say, um, it's not energy being blocked, but I really understand what you're saying. So of the exercises so I can try that. It is building up my, as you say, the balance of your thighs. It takes a long time to, because you, the energy in your muscles is hard to 
you get easily fatigued. Um, right. But I'm still working on it. But it's just interesting to see what I can do to help the other upper bit part of me. I can say I can sort of walk fine, but I do get quite fatigued. So, but thank you anyway. That that's a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It really answers the question. That, that's great. I can uh, have a go at that. The gently, gently, you. you know, very gently, gently. But if you did it. If you, did it daily, if you did uh, deep breathing for four or five minutes each day, your stamina would get stronger. It would. Yeah. You know. I've had a new, yeah, I, I, um, I'm trying to break hard on it at the moment, but so it is very gently, gently, and uh, yeah. but you've inspired me now to, to get going to. And spring is, and spring is yeah, coming, it's getting that, warmer. That, 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 <laughs> It's getting warmer. So it's <laughs> yes. Outside. Yeah. Hopefully in Scotland it'll be warmer. Yeah. Mm. But, yeah. But don't I, get I any... yeah. Visualize this yeah. as you breathe. Like literally see this reconstitution of the strength in the spine. You're imagining it as you're breathing. You're you're filling. Yeah. You're using the breath to to tell the body to inform the body. Mm -hmm. Like the two fish, the yin and yang, um, the physical and the non-physical, they interact with each other and they affect each other, you know? So the three cauldrons are metaphysical, the, the energy rather than flesh and bone, the, the, the pure energy and spiritual energy as well. But physical exercise benefits them, you know? So the kidney channel in the legs benefits the lower cauldron. The pericardium channel in the arms benefits the middle cauldron. And making your spinal cord as free as you can is going to benefit the upper cauldron. You know, and you just have to work within the boundaries of whatever handicap you have. But you know, none of us need it's trying to do in, you know internal healing, isn't it? It's trying to balance things yeah. out so you feel even though you can't get rid of condition but you can, yeah yeah, that, yeah that's, that's great so i can uh, so even, even if you can't stand you can do things like that and you know just lifting your shoulders up and down to free up your neck a little bit yeah. you know and, and really Stop. kind of making your chest concave so that your shoulder blades are rounded like a hedgehog you see like a hedgehog extending its bristles <laughs> so so with an exhale, I'm going to empty my chest, but make a roundedness with my back. So I'm going, <sighs> and that's a really good exercise too. I'm just coming back to normal. <laughs> but this, <sighs> but that's going to be really good for your heart and lungs, you know. And it is flexibility in the spine and the ribs and, and stuff. So you, and you can all sorry. You can always do these things by imagination as well. So if you are conscious of these uh, facts and ideas about energy and the cauldrons and so on, you can always close your eyes and imagine doing these movements and uh, then trying to do it physically and continue to widen your uh, flexibility by each exercise you're doing. and your brain wouldn't know the difference if you, you are really doing uh, this stuff or if you are just imagining. And I think when, uh, in, when you think about energy, um, it, this is also so precious because um, imagining energy moving your body up and down will just make it move because it's happening on a totally different uh, level than only on the body level so that might it's be key. Do, I do do meditation so it's getting back because I've had to wait to get going again because of the injury so uh, but yeah that, that's really really helpful thank you thank yeah. you uh, Emily oh, is right, right as well she uh, energy she goes where the intention tells it to go yes, a, yeah. the basic you know so having a clear mm -hmm. intent you know, that's why the gateways in the spine help, you know, because you can draw energy up to the lower gateway and put it into the lower cauldron and, and draw energy up to the middle gateway and put it into the middle cauldron. So you can kind of be precise about where you're putting vitality for your well-being 
and you could do that with anything. Yeah. You could put it, if you had a bad hip, you could put energy to the hip or something. Well, 100 years ago, the Holy See declared that it was, the universe was mind and matter and uh, spirit and matter, mind and body. And they, they removed the soul and the heart and they just kind of put the divine feminine off to the side and, and, for, and then went forward with this duality of a metaphysic, which isn't actually the real metaphysic because it's the heart that is, the, that, that is part of the entanglement that we are entangled with reality. This is the great mystery. The world and, and everything is, is very, very entangled. And if you don't have the heart as part of the three feet of the cauldron, then nothing makes sense. The, the imagination, the soul, the emotion, the, the, the anima that is the loving connection that we're here to bring. If that's not fundamental to the universe, the universe is heading into a, a, into a catastrophe. Mm. And here we are 1200 years later, and, and we, can, we can see the, the, you know, the, the turbulation we're in. So what, what we're here to do is re return the heart, the soul, the divine feminine into its proper place which is like this, it's, it's as fundamental as, this, as the sun, the moon. But the middle bowl is that heart center thing, you know, and it is, you know, your flesh and bone body will die, it will perish. Um, but that's the story of the salmon, isn't it? We incarnate, we come from somewhere to here, and then we go back. And that's the same as the salmon in its freshwater spawning ground, going into the salty ocean for a few years and then back to the freshwater spawning ground. You know, and we're, you know, anyone that's been in mystery traditions and become initiated as such is going to have connections with previous incarnations, or there's a, a connection of having been back to the source, that you're not just Joe blogs in this incarnation. There's more to you than that. Really lovely, Yuri. What a lovely insight. It's, it's really very uh, precious what you're doing here. Thank you so much. And everybody else for all your. It really, it's just driven by uh, the Owen Grove and just think it, this came about by looking at alder and then willow and then thinking about stuff to do the salmon of wisdom and of course how that 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 is all lower cauldron stuff and then we're coming into ash in the spring equinox so uh we've still got a week of willow but then when we're in the days of ash the sun is the sun itself is going to do the salmon leap from pisces to aries yeah. and then suddenly the days are longer than the nights you know the sun yeah, fascinating all that. And so we're the stories become much more than stories when they're embodied by the stars and the turning of the year and, and everything, aren't they? You know, and not only is it external in the sense that it's the macrocosm outside of us, but there's also internal cosmology, and that's the qigong and the inner work and stuff, you know. And there's Although I'm, you know, my background is qigong and stuff, so I'm keen on that. But it's it's perfectly valid to just lie down and do shamanic journeys to the drum to each of the cauldrons. So you could visit your lower cauldron as a vision quest and walk around it as whatever landscape it manifests its way to you. You know, you can explore your inner world sort of thing. But the star law is that. The lady of the lake or the salmon of wisdom are in our lower cauldron all of us that, that's there in all of us yuri as as i've um, alluded to you um writing an article about branwin and and bran uh, i took such a deep dive into the archetypal material that I, that I got into an altered state, which reminded me of the, the, the third human joy, poetic privilege. I, I, was, I was so 
um, involved in the myth that that everything I looked at seemed to be connected to everything. And, I, you know, it's like, it's a kind of madness. It's fire in the head. But one of the things that I, that I saw when I was in this altered state that I think is really important and worth sharing, and that is um, birth trauma is what got misconstrued into original sin. So we're not born with original sin. We're born with birth trauma. And then fairy tales are primarily baby talk. Baby talk is what helps the infant recover from the birth trauma. Because the child is coming out of Anwin. It's coming out of this incredible archetypal realm, entering into an exterior world where now everything is turned inside out. And the trauma of getting out can be really severe. That's the original sin. And so baby talk and nurture and, and the shining brow is literally the radiant smile of the parents who, who, who are letting the child know you're here, you're safe, you've made it, we've got you, we love you. And that begins a healthy emotional life. But if we don't get that, we end up with patriarchy. F. Nysen, this emotionally crazy, irrational, violent reaction to external experience because the internal world has not been um, loved. You know, the, the, the eternity of God or the creator, the mother black hole has not been manifested. You know, it's, it's, it's so so we're left in a in a swamp with dangerous forms in the imagination. Anyway, yeah, that's what that's now. But that's my idea, right? Original and and birth trauma. That's what we're talking about. My my son had birth trauma. Really, he was an emergency cesarean, and he wasn't breathing properly. So. Uh, his mum was devastated because she was hoping for immediate skin to skin bonding and he got rushed off to mm. intensive care in an incubator to help him breathe, you know, so she had to wait a good 16 hours before she could touch him. And, uh, but mm. now, now he's three years old and, and he just loves being read to doesn't matter what book it is. He, and he probably had that book a hundred times already, but it's more to do with the, closeness and the talking isn't it you know it is what you just said about how you're here we've got you you're you're looked after and, and stuff you know um and, and it's branwin with the starling now when branwin is suffering in patriarchy she she heals an injured starling and, and the starling is a symbol of druidry and it's the bird that brings the forest the forest of the dru of, of the ruins yeah of, of the oan Here they're a migratory bird as well. They come and go with the seasons, like the salmon returning and going out to sea and returning. So there's that, with the starling, there's that between worlds, between two different realms, back and forth kind of thing. Kind of in, in the story, it's Ireland and Britain, but it could be, you know, the real world and the fairy tale world. or a patriarchy and a good, healthy kingdom, you know, where the king and queen are doing well, as opposed to a patriarchy where it's just, you know, really a fallen, savage environment. That's interesting then, you know, kind of like about how head and heart really upper and middle. So the head without a heart is not a desirable thing. And, uh, but both the head and the heart depend upon the healthy wholesomeness of the lower cauldron, you know? So it can be an abyss of monsters, um, but it's also where the salmon of wisdom are and the great goddess and stuff. I wonder whether there's um, any connection, you know, with the pentagram that you did um, discovered with the yew tree, the willow, ivy, 
time. That's four. I can't remember the other one. Sorry. Um, but I keep hearing you tree, you tree, you tree with the salmon and the salmon going back in that space in between as well, because obviously the yew tree grows out and goes under again and then grows again. Um, they can be both sexes. Um, and that's and when Franklin was talking about something earlier that really resonated. But I just feel that there's something in that pentagram because I was thinking, why is the why is the salmon here when actually I feel like the yew tree really like connects with the salmon? And then I'm thinking of your pentagram that you did because they're all evergreen apart from the willow and that's where the salmon is. Um, so I don't know if there's any connection because the evergreen, obviously they're ever going, they're eternal. I don't know, what do you think? I think, I think that's really interesting. I don't have an answer, but um, yeah, definitely the salmon of wisdom are with the willow and the willow is that back to the source thing but of course the yew tree is the winter solstice so that is the very lowest part of our energy circle you know that's the perineum between the legs if you like you know and and so it's as low as we go and then we draw energy up the spinal cord to the summer solstice and, then and back also down. the yew yeah sorry um, i didn't mean to yeah go on you off. i think i'm a bit delayed <laughs> so um but yeah of course so heard with the yew tree and the shining ones and that was one of those divisions um yeah there as well um and the breath the, the in between the breath for the yew tree and that, that three days in between where everything and nothing exists so you know it's where the salmon starts and where they end and it goes back to the source so the, the phrase and, the phrase in that paragraph was uh Shegis of the she and Shegis is like Connell as well so if you're not familiar with the words it's just like saying the well the sacred well of the she or, or the sacred well of the shining ones or the spirit world or something you know however you see see the word she it can be used in lots of ways but certainly it's non-physical isn't it it's the uh, spiritual reality yeah yeah and it's the sacred yeah. well. So that's where so, it is. And again, so that fish yeah. was going back up the boin to the source, which is in the non-physical. Yeah. And the yew tree, um, you can stand um, within the yew tree under the branches. And I think there's something in, is it, there's a mist or something that happens. And I don't know, I think it's something to do with the iron levels, is it? Um, I can't, I can't quite remember. Um, but the the redness, the iron levels or something like that really connects with our heart as well. And my point was that being under the yew tree, I think people used to, um, are, they say shamans can go into this and have their visions and, and go into the other worlds. Um, and I think that's interesting because the yew tree obviously goes right and then if allowed to grow, they go down again and then come back up. So there is kind of no end. And they create that being able that portal to to go into the other world as well. That's very similar to uh, I I started coming up with ideas with something which I call tree breathing, uh, and it's inspired a bit by like back flower remedies or something. But it's the essence of of a flower for medicinal purposes. But that my approach was a qigong approach and taking a leaf from the small orbit of chi and the big orbit of chi and how that is usually used in a tantric sexual way. But equally, you could stand with the palm of your hands touching a tree trunk and from the bubbling springs in the balls of your feet, you can draw energy up from the roots of the tree, up your spinal cord, and then you can send it through your hands back into the tree. And that you've got this cycle of energy of, mm -hmm. of it's not being a vampire, it's equal give and take, but you're having a mm -hmm. relationship or an exchange with that tree, you know. Mm -hmm. And um just yeah. like just like we give them carbon dioxide and they give us oxygen, you know, that, that we do have this symbiotic mm -hmm. thing as well. So if you've got a you know, making love to a tree <laughs> sort of thing, or just yeah, it's all medicine, isn't it? Amplify what yeah. you're saying, Mary. Claire, our token 
J.R.R. Mm -hmm. Tolkien said that the shiny ones, the elves, first taught the trees to talk. The trees were the first ones that the elves, the shining ones, will awoke. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> No, what they van, said. Out of eternity. Sorry, Frank, I'm sorry, before you finish. Go on. Eternity, they came from eternity. <laughs> Cutting everybody off tonight online. <laughs> so, to, to, to do that kind of tree breathing, you would have to focus on the lower cauldron. And, and I've tried it. You know, the ground isn't always level. You know, we, here there's a perfect wooden floor, but in the forest, the tree trunks are all over the place. So, the first thing you have to do is to get your hands on the tree trunk, but then you've got to get your hips level. Mm -hmm. uh, the hips need to be horizontally level so that the spine is vertical sort of thing. You don't want to be mm -hmm. leaning, you know? So getting your lower cauldron balanced and stable, and then you can relax your spine into the roots with the tree and everything. So mm -hmm. physicality again, to make that spiritual connection better. But equally, you could just lie down on the yeah. ground beneath the tree, you know, but it's, you're not activating the thighs and cooking that way. But there's no, there's no right there or wrong. There's more different into... ways. Carry on. I'm definitely delayed. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, there was one thing. <laughs> There was, um, so I did this uh, You Mysteries course and actually it allowed me to understand how, the, it, basically he talks about re to meet the yew tree, it's specifically on the yew tree, and to re-embody ourselves. We, to, we, to meet the yew tree, we have to re-embody ourselves. And he talks about the blood mantle and becoming the blood uh, first. So it's that we must go to that place before we were born and after we die. And, and the first thing that comes is the blood. And so we re-embody ourselves as our blood mantle. And that's how we meet the yew tree. And then, then that's how you can connect with them on that in that other world. And I'm just thinking about when you're saying about the tree breathing, like I feel like that's that's how I that's how I experience it is is myself out out inward. In, inside out yeah and meeting them with my energy really do you know what I mean but I thought the blood mantle was really interesting as well one of the Taoist qigong practices is just to stand still and you have your arms like this and and uh it's called zhan zhong or standing pole exercise or people say standing like a tree but you would just stand uh for 20 minutes half an hour and just relax your spine and the highest level is to have no thoughts at all, nothing, just peaceful, just breathing in and out with no chatter in your brain. You know, and the Taoist monks will do it for an hour, they stand for hours just being there. But we can only do it for a moment in time, wherever, even if you could do an hour or two, you still got to go for, to the toilet and get some food or, or what have you, you know. <laughs> Whereas trees are doing it constantly. They spend their whole lifetime just growing and reaching and, and they're, they're in that zone and a yew tree is going to do thousands of years literally if it's left alone it will do that for thousands of years and energetically there's a heart center in every tree a center point but they're fixed they're a fixed center point they, they're at their location they can't physically go for a walk and we're walking trees we're walking center points you know we take our tree trunks and branches with us our spinal cords and peripheral nervous system but we are trees we're just no we're just walkable trees or walkable center points but we're the same you know i, I love all that thought so when you come together for tree breathing it's not really that there's a 1000 year old yew tree and you're an alien you know, that we are a symbiotic thing. We're, we're as much part of the woodland as the robin and the squirrel, you know, we, we, we are. But most of us are quite divorced from it and separated from it. So, uh, you know. The can I have, well, at some point, can I just offer a brief song on that that comes up? The, about the, what's come up 
for me. I am a walking tree, you are a walking tree. I am a walking tree, you are a walking tree. I breathe in what you breathe out, you breathe in what I breathe out. I breathe in what you breathe out, you breathe in what I breathe out. Bringing the light down into the darkest ground. Bringing the light down into the darkest ground. Feet on the earth, head in the sky. Feet on the earth, head in the sky. Releasing the life force into the earth. Releasing your life force into the world. Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Very and it goes with the theme. Uh, the Native Americans uh, say uh, that the trees are our standing brothers and sisters. I love that so very much. It's yeah. such, a, such a beautiful uh, image and idea. And thank you for the song. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is, it is um, quarter to nine, so we better go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Yuri. It's been Thank you. Lovely. I'll get it on YouTube before the end of the night. Yep. Oh, good. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.